Uh, welcome to uh, session one. So this session is about uh, distributors' incentives to uh, adopt more efficient pricing. Um, submissions on this topic have been uh, mixed. Um, some submitters argued that distributors uh, really don't have the right incentives to do this um, on their own and that the authority needs to step in and regulate. Um, other submitters took the opposite view, uh, that distributors do have the right incentives and the authority doesn't really need to do anything in this space. Uh, we have an open mind um, at this stage. The authority doesn't have a, a decided view. Um, might just cover off what we mean by more efficient pricing. Um, this is not the focus of today, so we're not going to um, focus too heavily on this uh, question in this session. Um, we will put out some guidance, perhaps at a, a later stage of the review. Um, at this stage, we'll stay at a fairly high level. And so at a high level, we can say efficient pricing is uh, service-based and cost-reflective. It's uh, pricing that sends the right signals to consumers who are making decisions about uh, use of the network and perhaps investment in uh, evolving technologies. Uh, and it's uh, pricing that um, marks a shift away from a traditional pricing structure dominated by flat consumption charges. So there are a number of factors that uh, influence distributors' incentives, and we're just going to illustrate just a few of them here. Uh, so there's revenue risk. Um, the longer term, there's, there's asset stranding. There's uh, signaling future costs. Risk of regulation, avoiding cross-subsidization. So these are uh, some of the incentives, there are also factors that facilitate the transition, like uh, smart meters. Um, and these are just uh, factors relevant to uh, distributors. Of course, the, uh, the long-term benefits for consumers um, uh, from more efficient pricing uh, could be very substantial. So on the other hand, there are a number of factors that uh, push in the opposite direction. And again, we can uh, just illustrate a few of the main ones. Uh, some distributors might adopt a head-in-the-sand approach. Some may lack resources. Uh, the LFC regulations, the low fixed charge regulations, um, as Jenny uh, pointed out, we released some guidelines on these uh, last week. Those guidelines focus on the authority's uh, interpretation of the uh, definition of variable charges under the regulations. Um, so as the authorities, the enforcement authority, the enforcement agency for the regulations, we thought that, that those guidelines might be helpful information for distributors thinking about this issue. Uh, issues with the price cap, potentially other issues with the revenue cap, perverse incentives. Nobody wants to be in the news for the wrong reasons. And I think understand some people in this room have recent experience of that. Um, so there are a number of factors uh, that uh, some pushing in the direction of more efficient pricing and some uh, pushing in the opposite direction. Um, we don't have a view at this stage on which are more likely to dominate and the authority doesn't have a, a decided view on what regulatory action, if any, it needs to take in this space. But uh, we certainly hope that, um, that this conversation this morning will uh, help to shed some light on these issues. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Tim. So first of our three speaker perspectives. So the way I'll do it, these guys get 10 minutes each. So 10, that's the number between 9 and 11, just to remind the speakers. A couple of people think 10 is the number between 17 and 19. Sort of not really the case. Uh, facts are how we're running this process. Um, what I'll do is I'll give each of the three speakers their time, um, and then we can start the discussion session. Um, just to manage a few expectations in the room, the idea is that this is a room discussion it's not just about you firing your questions at one of the three speakers. So if you try and do that, I might intervene and prevent you from doing that. So I'm the filter through which all this stuff works, so we're all clear on that. Right, so our first uh, speaker is Nathan Strong. Um, Nathan is the general manager, uh, business assurance for Unison, which is the uh, Lions business in the Hawke's Bay and uh, Central North Island, Taupo Rotorua. So hop up onto the lectern, Nathan, and your 10 minutes has already started. Thanks, John. Um, 
And so, as John says, I'm a General Manager of Business Assurance, and one of the areas of responsibility that I've had for the last six years at Unison is network pricing. Uh, so it's something that I'm keenly interested in. And as John also said, I'm representing Unison today, uh, not here as the, um, the chair of the ENA's regulatory working group. Um, though I have spoken to a lot of our members, and I think um, there's pretty widespread agreement with the, the principles that I'll certainly talk about today. So the authority posed these questions. Uh, what are the incentives? What's stopping us? What are the factors? And how are our incentives changing? So I'll seek to address those points in this presentation. But if I was to sum things up, um, it would be with this slide. So as many of you will have seen, um, in the last week or so we had a, the worst snowstorm um, in the central region in 54 years of records, 200 poles down, hundreds of customers out. And in that situation, it's not about regulatory incentives or commercial incentives to do the right thing by customers. We go out with generators. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard job keeping the guy, the field workers from getting out in the field too early to do the storm response. You know, we don't do the, the town hall meetings every day um, because of regulatory incentives. It's about doing the right thing by customers. And we will very much put pricing reform in that same category. Pricing reform is about looking after our customers. So I'll talk a little, little bit about the context that we face. So back in 2010, most people had a very similar load profile. So we had managed to obtain from the sort of fairly small population of smart meters that existed at the time, the load profile of about 3,000 customers. And at the top of those charts, you can see the sort of thick orange lines indicating a pretty standard load profile for about 90% of customers. People basically, there was a really high correlation between your total annual consumption and your use of the network at peak times. So in that context, <clears throat> and we, we, at that time we really only had fairly basic metering technology that could, could signal very loose um, signals around day-night pricing, controlled, uncontrolled loads uh, for, for hot water heating. So at that point in time, flat volume-based charges were a pretty reasonable way to go. It was pretty much our only choice, and it was pretty socially equitable across customers. But times have changed a lot in six years. So customers, and I would stress, and I've got it in the title there, it's only some customers have choices and incentives to look at alternatives. And you know, clearly we look at all the, the new stuff that's coming along, the solar, electric cars, batteries, um, but there's a lot of old technologies that people are increasingly looking at when they're facing a 30 cent per kilowatt hour retail price signal. So that's, that's how we see the customer context. So now I'll talk about um, what I'm up here for, which is the incentives shaping us. So we kind of look at us from a long-term perspective. Over the next <coughs> 10 years, we expect to add $8 billion worth of ne network investment to the existing 10 billion that we've already got. And we don't expect to break even on that investment, for f that, those new investments, for 40 plus years given current regulatory settings. So we necessarily have to take that long-term view of our businesses and make sure that we have price settings that will make sure that we're enduringly relevant to our customers. So it makes sense to put in place good price signals to make sure that we're minimising that, that investment in our network. And so from a Unison perspective, we spend a lot of money on a smart grid, and that's all aimed at extending the life of our existing assets, utilising our assets more, and pricing is going to complement that by encouraging people to make better decisions around you know, their discretionary use of electricity at peak times. So the commercial incentives for pricing reform we would see is coming down to <clears throat> the fact that if, if we don't do anything, as fewer kilowatt hours flow through our networks, then prices necessarily have to increase to cover costs. So that just creates that ongoing cycle of people more and more looking at alternatives. <clears throat> Um, as we have a bigger constituency of people that have invested in those alternatives and seeking to make a return on those, we just create a, a bigger pool of issues where customers you know, will resist reform. So I think we've got an opportunity before there's mass deployment of batteries or solar or whatever it is to make sure we can get those price signals out there before there's political or regulatory intervention to stop that. And I think we've already seen in Victoria, Australia, an example where a network company over there has come up with the right kind of pricing design and the government has come in at the end over the top and said it can only be opt-in. And I guess they're just managing that sort of political risk. Um, 
I guess the other risk that, that we see as a business is, is the regulatory one. So at the moment, under Commerce Commission rules, uh, in exchange for a, a low rate of return on, on our investments, uh, we're protected from asset stranding risk. Essentially, that gets socialised across customers. <clears throat> but we could see that changing in the longer term. You know, if, if there's a mass deployment of batteries and there is effectively a, a quasi-alternative to the network, then we could see the case being made, and it might be difficult to resist, that the optimisation and economic value write-down rules that we used to have under ODV, do you ever say it, uh, could come back. So there's, there's good commercial and regulatory incentives, I think, for distributors to reform prices. And I think for us, uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that I think we'll face, and Graham said this in his presentation as well, is that you know, electric vehicles are coming. And the worst outcome that we can, we can see as a network business is that we have people coming home from work and plugging in that 100,000 electric vehicles, creating new peak demands. And yes, there's a benefit through more kilowatt hours going through the network, but that'll be more than offset by the increased uh, investment that we have to make in peak capacity. So getting price signals right to make sure people charge their electric vehicles during the, the troughs overnight is absolutely the right thing to do. And I guess, as I've said before, you know, there's, the biggest issue here is that customer imperative for reform. You know, most of us are actually owned by our, our customers or our communities, and so you know, our, <clears throat> our fortunes are, are intimately tied with the fortunes of our community. So failing to undertake price reform does a disservice to our customers. It does a disservice to those people that are making those very expensive investments and alternatives, and it does a disservice to those people that are left you know, shouldering the burden of the grid um, as more kilowatt hours defect away from the network. As I said before, the longer we leave it, the larger the resistance to reform and the, the, the greater the challenge ahead. So starting soon will give us more time to make that transition. So what's slowing us down? <clears throat> so we've heard that um, price cap regulation is, is a factor. So at the moment, if we make price changes, um, we face the risk under price cap regulation that any unanticipated behavioural responses will reduce revenue and we have to wait till the next regulatory period to adjust things. So that's a bit of a barrier and the Commerce Commission is proposing to fix that in 2020 with a move to revenue cap regulation <clears throat> and that's something that the ENA strongly supports. Um, I think the other key challenges in this really are the implementation challenges. So. As Graham said, we've, the, the ENA has done a lot of work to develop different pricing options, and we're going to consult with retailers about that, and talk to customers about that in terms of working out what the right approach is. But then it's going to take some time to actually calibrate those pricing approaches, so we'll need data from retailers to help us with that. Uh, there's a big coordination challenge in terms of 29 different distributors. I think we're outnumbered by retailers now. We've got to involve the metering equipment providers and the data managers. And bring that all together to get you know, a big step change in, in pricing approach. Low fixed charge regulations, it's correct to say that they are not a barrier necessarily to pricing reform. But it probably does prevent us from looking at some, some other innovative options around how we price for electricity. And there's been discussion of, sort of those, those broadband-like packages where you know, maybe you pay $80 a month for your basic service. You might get a discount of $10 if we can control the charging of your electric vehicle. Another $10 if we can control your hot water. But that would be prohibited by the low fixed charge regulations. So it is something that I think needs to be looked at. As I said, we do have those commercial challenges that we need to overcome in, in quite a fragmented industry. And that's just going to take time. But I think in terms of the, uh, the age-old 80-20 rule, the, the big challenge in this is actually the customer communications challenge. You know, people often don't understand electricity. Most people, when you talk to them, think that the fixed charge on the bill is for the lines and the rest is for the retailer, and that's not right. So there's a huge education that we need to go through in terms of people understanding what they currently get, let alone before we introduce these new sophisticated options. So there is that real challenge around building the case for reform and helping customer understanding. And I guess there's a risk in all of this too because you know, what is the role that retailers are going to play in that versus distributors, particularly if there's, there's different bundling of how we approach things. So summing up, 
We certainly think that pricing uh, reform is a win-win for customers and for network businesses. As Graham said before, you know, this should help reduce network investment and prices compared to the counterfactual of doing nothing. It should help uh, customers make the right decision, avoid uneconomic bypass and cost shifting between consumers. And I guess I just come back to this point. There's two things that we sell. One is access, and the other is capacity, the ability to use as much electricity as you like at peak times. What we don't sell is kilowatt hours, but that's what customers currently see. So price reform is not going to be easy, but the prize is worth it. And as Graham said, we're up for the challenge. <clears throat> Right, thank you very much, Nathan. So repeal the low user fixed charge regulations and it'll be fine. So we should be done uh, in about 15 minutes. Anyway, we just made to make sure that that's, uh, that isn't the whole story. So our next speaker has the best job title of anyone speaking today. Um, Michael Pryor, um, I was talking to him beforehand, joined Contacts about a year ago. Um, and his uh, role now is head of designing tomorrow, which is pretty cool. Um, but Michael's background isn't in our industry, so he may have a couple of insights that might be worth listening to. So please, Michael, but 10 minutes again. It's that number between 9 and 11. We're, we're nearly there. But, uh. We'll just rough it. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, so a couple of health warnings, and you have stolen my thunder a little bit, actually. Um, being new to the industry means you get the pleasure of being able to open the covers, um, you know, looking from the outside in. And I've only been here less than a year, and, and you kind of come in from the outside, you look at an industry and you go, I understand complexity, and then you open the covers and you go, oh my goodness, and you just put the covers back down again. So I've come out of telco, banking and insurance, which are all varyingly different degrees of regulation and complexity, and boy, I've managed through some quite significant um, behavioural changes, regulatory changes, structural changes and reforms, so um, I'm looking forward to being um, a key part of this particular one. I think you're going to hear some very, very consistent themes, and uh, I think it's kind of interesting that a retailer is wedged between two distribution companies on a, on, on a topic of incentives, but I think the consistent themes that you're going to hear over and over again is the word customer, customer, customer. When I don't understand something, I go back to my happy place, which is to actually understand the world that our customers live in. So thank you very much for putting up some voice of customer uh, insights. I'm going to just touch on a, a few to help frame up why I think uh, incentives in the context of laying it up to customers and a $3 billion revenue stream that it's, it, that's at stake uh, is actually really important. So look, uh, I'm going to begin perhaps with the, the, the suggestion that um, we get on to action. I'm going to put three actions out here right up front before I, I dive into sort of three very specific points I want to make. I think the first action that we really need to, to sort of focus on is bringing customer design right to the forefront consistently across every single constituent member in this group. We probably have 29 different cottage industries and customer design thinking going on out there who are all imagining different worlds, who are all designing different futures, mm -hmm. yet we're all here as one industry trying to serve one purpose at the end of the day, which is to make sure that access to energy is both affordable, reasonable and equitable. Can we please stop the cottage industry and in customer experience design and coordinate? The second action I'd like to put out there as an incentive is to very, very clearly think about what the word prescription means. We hear a lot about complexity of networks. We hear a lot about the 29 different um, you know, sort of complex, com complex environments we have to deal with, as, particularly as retailers, all the different demand signals that are being sent, all the different infrastructures that are being dealt with there, all the different kind of profiles, uh, all the different shareholdings and the various interests that you've got, all the different capital that's at stake. At the end of the day, we certainly think from a retailing perspective that the one thing as an action plan that we would like to take is to understand what the word prescription actually means and actually commit to putting some degree of prescription forward and then following through on it. If we leave this up to a uncoordinated, unstructured and quite divergent set of principles that are not prescribed, we're at huge risk of confusing the consumer even more than they are confused today. The third one is an action I think we should really be taking around. What are we actually future-proofing against and for what time frame? And I'm going to quote something that came out of um, 
some various papers. I did quite a bit of deep diving on this topic. You know, when I was asked to speak, I thought, oh my God, I don't really know what I'm talking about. So I went and, and did a whole lot of deep diving into this topic. And I just found one really, really interesting comment that came out. And I won't, um, I think it's from one of the distributors actually. And it's talking about the value of being technology agnostic. And it says, regulation of networks is unlikely to keep pace with the rapidly expanding choices for customers and the choices that are making it a lot easier for customers in this tech-oriented world. There is a whole host of unrecognised energy needs and we collectively need to develop new business models as people move towards self-generation, sharing energy, community sharing, peer-to-peer, the, the, the role of apps, you name it, it goes on and on and on. There are a whole raft of new kinds of technologies that we haven't even begun to explore. And candidly, and I'll, I'll put a view out here that says, you know, we've, we've got some very um, strong and, and very um, clear line of sight to why we have to understand, um, you know, the distributed generation world, you know, but we're really only talking at the moment about 10 to 20,000 customers. What about the other 1.85 million customers who, over the course of the next five, maybe 10 years, are going to have their worlds completely tipped upside down by digital disruption? So those are the three action things that I'd like to put out there. Um, but I think to, to sort of anchor it in voice a customer, I wanted to sort of really give context for what it's like to live in the world of a customer. And the quotes that you put up are, are very, very relevant. And I went back into our research logs, went back into our kind of focus group discussions, and I really pulled out these five case studies that I thought were really, really interesting. The first was Glenda in the far north, who has invested over $10,000 in solar at considerable cost to the inheritance that she had from her family. She has no recollection for why she made the decision other than the fact that her power bills were going to be less in winter, which is not necessarily the case. No price signal conversation was had with that particular customer at all. They just did what they thought was the right thing to do, and they thought their bills would be cheaper in winter. It's actually been quite grim in the north um, this year, and the sun hasn't really been shining, so she's actually not in a very good position. Then you take the situation of a, a gentleman called Niwa, who in a focus group revealed to us that he's got seven children aged between five and 15 in a house of three bedrooms in a relatively wealthy suburb in Auckland, modest council home, struggling to make ends meet, low income earner, absolutely committed to making sure that um, their house is warm. They've never thought about demand pricing. They've never even mentioned the word capacity. They don't even understand the choices that they've got in front of them. And in fact, they don't even have the ability to make the choices that many have made already in using new technologies. But that is the world of the customer that we are facing every day as a retailer, and the distributors obviously need to address that as well. Then you take the likes of a Sally. Wonderful case study I heard the other day. Um, embraced the whole wholesale energy market pricing model, embraced with vigour the free energy power day, power, power, of, the, power of the hour, um, so much so that she changed her entire life. She's living at home as a solo mother with three children, realised the benefits of being told how to demand shift her, her time, and has completely reorganised her entire day to maximise the free power hour. The sad thing is she realised after three months of doing this that the only people that missed out on the fact that she was running around like a blue assed fly trying to organise her entire household were her kids. She had no time left to sit down with her kids at the time of the day that it really mattered because she was too busy organising her entire life to make use of her free hour of power. Then you take the wealthy couple in the Hawke's Bay who have had solar on their roof for 10 years who purely made the decision from a completely altruistic point of view. The word solar tax has never been mentioned in conversations. They have never even mentioned the word demand capacity. And they're about to move into EV because they believe it's the right thing to do. And they've got to completely reconfigure their garage to actually deliver a completely different experience for themselves going forward. Wonderful choice to be able to make. They've got a double income household at the absolute upper end of the, of, of the um, Hawke's Bay lifestyle. And then you get the last person, and it's going to be me, I'm sorry to say, but there's nothing like your own voice a customer. I am Mr. Set and Forget. I have had four adult children at home. 
They have all left in the last two years, and I have gone from renovating a drafty old bungalow, done all the right things for the last 22 years, but I have set and forget. I actually don't care. At the end of the day, I have the means to be able to do that. And so I think the, 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 the thing that really stands out from those kind of five very, very simple cases is that customers are hugely irrational and make major lifestyle decisions that have long-term consequences on how they live their lives. It's not just about energy. The word capacity, demand, and all of these other the, the sort of the terminologies that we're using have never even entered their equation. So I absolutely agree with our colleagues probably today that the communication challenge and the incentive on us getting this right is massive. Do not underestimate it. And if I could finish, I think um, one of the, the, the industries that we could learn very, very quickly from, and, and there are some certain parallels, so it was interesting to see the broadband example put up. Um, and this is the, 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 the benefits of moving at speed, I suppose, but the consequences of moving at speed. I'm sure we've all time shifted our viewing of um, television, linear TV no longer is the way we consume. Uh, the death of TV in its traditional form. Um, along comes broadband, along comes Netflix, along comes streaming on demand, and suddenly we're actually watching more TV than we ever watched before. Who is the industry that's probably benefited the most from that? The broadband industry, understandably. But thankfully, they've got a very, very strong um, regulatory framework that says there is an underpinner in there around wholesale fixed prices. Sadly, the retailer at the end of the day is the one that's actually had to carry the, the consequences of the demand, not just doubling, but nearly tripling inside 18 months for the services over those pipes. So I think we're facing exactly the same issue. Um, we've got to really understand what kind of future-proofing time horizons we're actually addressing here. And so when I think about incentives, it's all about understand the irrational lifestyles that we're lining up to address with our customer, understand the planning horizons and the future proofing of technologies that many of us probably haven't even thought of but are designing today, and making sure that we put the customer at the forefront of that entire design thinking process, and I suppose be prescriptive about you know, understanding the kind of deliberate choices that we can make as a coordinated industry. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks very much, Michael. So uh, three calls to action and a rather intriguing call for more prescription without too much specificity about what should be prescribed. So I think we might hear a bit more about that later on. Right, so our third, um, our third presenter goes both ways. He's intriguingly described as the former chief executive of Orion, and I thought it might be worth adding that he's also the former energy trading director of South Power, so he um, sees it from both sides. Um, great thinker, but Roger Sutton, thank you very much for agreeing to come along. I suspect this might be quite controversial, so let's see what happens. Te ten minutes? That oh, minute? yeah. ten. Sweet. Yeah, well, the last time I talked in a... A room as big as this, it was about a red zone meeting in Christchurch and some old guy was sitting in the front and I asked if everybody could hear me and he said, I can hear you fine, but I'm happy to swap with someone who can't. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to be in a, not to be in that sort of environment. So look, I'm also a director of Network Tasman, but I'm not talking on behalf of Network Tasman, I'm really just talking on behalf of myself, so you can't attribute this back to um, Network Tasman. So look, I was going to try and give the perspective of a director though, you know, how do we see these sorts of issues, how do we think about incentives, how do we think, or how do I think, as a director, we can actually build an environment where companies will actually start making changes that meets the needs of our, of our, of our customers. So the first thing to say is as a director, we see this as, 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 as director, we see this as a really important issue. We see it as an issue we want to fix. Um, when I turn up to the boardroom of Network Tasman, I turn up thinking about Mrs. Rowling in Kaitiriturri, or Mrs. Barwick, who lives in Motuaka. I'm there thinking about the long-term interests of the customers. There's been a little bit of discussion today about whether the EA could um, regulate in this area and, try and just fix the problem by passing some regulation. I, mean, I think that would be incredibly difficult. Um, one thing is just politically, if you think about this, you know, this is going to benefit 
by a small amount a large number of customers and cause, if you like, a, a cost to a small number of customers. Is that, is that the right way around? You know, on average it's good, but it's going to disadvantage probably a small number of customers, any sort of pricing change. And political organisations almost never, ever go there because politicians never give them a mandate to do anything as difficult as that. And um, I know about this stuff. But I mean, so is there a role though? For, you know, what is really the role for the EA in this, in this next phase? And I think their key role is to give us an industry courage and confidence. Jenny talked about C's, but my C's in this case are courage and confidence. Because some of this will be difficult, it will be tricky. And I think the EA have got a really, really important role, if you like, backing the industry as they make changes. And when I, when I say backing, and that means that where Network Tasman or Electricity Ashburton or Wellington Electricity have made some changes and they've been on morning report with Guy and Espiner and then the next person is some unhappy customer, then I think the EA have to be there talking about the issue and putting some effort into how they talk about it. That doesn't mean they have to... That doesn't mean they need to say that, you know, Wellington Electricity or Ryan, everyone has nice haircuts or whatever. They don't have to back them 100%, but it's really, really important they're there speaking really calmly, giving a broad perspective on the issue and talking about how, in overall sense, this actually gives benefits to consumers as a whole. So regulating this, you know, if the EA was to go off and run a work stream to, to pass some regulations here, it would cost like this much, if not more. And I'm not asking for, and so when the EA thinks about how it's going to support the industry in doing this, we're not asking them to spend this much, but they, they need to see it as an important work stream where they put some real effort in. You know, Brent Layton or Carl gets into work, oh Carl, you've got a little bit of time today, could you talk to this reporter about XYZ? No. This becomes a really, really important area where I think the EA will have to put some real effort in to support it and make sure there's actually an intelligent discussion. The, 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 look, I've got two more points. One of the other points was, as companies do things, they will make mistakes. You know, I think, as people said, a lot of this is around communication, how we communicate, and companies will screw that up. They'll, they'll, they'll do some things well, they'll do things badly. We have to learn from each other's mistakes, guys. And, and as a director, that's one of the key things I'm going to be saying to my leaders in my business. Are we learning from other people's mistakes as they make changes? It's just, and that's another reason why we want to do it and why the government, why the EA won't be very good at doing it, because government doesn't make mistakes. Because they don't make mistakes, they never learn from their mistakes. Well, we can make mistakes and we can be open about our mistakes with each other. If there is a role for the EA here, apart from giving us courage and confidence, I think it will be watching over the distributors, though, that have actually got um, a buck both ways. I think distributors that are investing heavily in PV, in battery businesses, I think we do need to make sure they are actually being honest with their pricing. I think it would be very easy to run a, a distribution business, um, make a lot of money on a competitive side selling PVs and never actually fix your pricing. So I think there are actually, there is actually another category of distributor, to, distributor here and the EA does have a role there in watching to make sure they are actually making those changes that meet the needs of the broader community. So look, that's it. So to conclude, um, we have got the incentives. The EA have got a really important role in giving us courage and confidence and backing us. And we as an industry, as we go forward, we need to be open and honest about learning from our mistakes. Thank you. Right, thank you very much, Roger, and thank you very much to our other speakers. Um, there's something about incentives here that um, obviously by volunteering to speak, our speakers have slightly stolen the thunder from the rest of you because they've had your attention and they've set the, uh, set the stage. So um, 
you know, I think, uh, I think we should respect that. Um, and uh, we're already starting to hear some of these sort of divisions from uh, the one side, Nathan saying, look, I'm just about gonna double the investment in sunk assets uh, that I'm gonna be uh, managing over the next however many decades it was. So I'm gonna be very, very careful that I don't wind up with a big stranded asset problem on my books. Um, through to this anxiety that um, you know the industry needs to be kept honest and in particular those horrible lines businesses need to be kept honest so there's a sort of uh, conversation not quite happening but people are at least clearing their throats here so this isn't a question and answer session now we've got um, best part of an hour and 20 minutes um, really to start building on the foundations that the authorities set out with their um, consultation paper um, and the various submissions that you've all made on it and the positions that we've outlined here um, about what the actual obstacles to this just happening through an organic process are um, and whether it's necessary either for somebody in a position of authority like um, the authority um, or simply participants in the industry and a sort of um, a collective of the willing um, to start making things happen that might otherwise not happen at all or might simply take too long to happen and wind up with outcomes that are not really to uh, the authorities um, statutory objective uh, which might require them to do some things anyway so uh, um, that's, that's about where I think we are. So if I could ask my roving mic people to sort of rove, um, who, if anyone, would like to uh, get the ball rolling, either with a, a question or an observation or a, an offer, offer to do some work? That would be quite good. I'm rather hoping we might get a few of those before the end of the day, but still early. Or are we just going to have a, a deafening silence where we all look at our shoes and wait for, wait for lunch? Uh, Quite. We've got anyone muttering over there? Well, I've got something to get the ball rolling. Roger, did you want to do something? So yeah. remember, introduce yourself, introduce your affiliation, and then ask your question nice and slowly so that people can hear it or make your statement. It's not just about questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Roger Proctor. I'm currently a consultant to the Electricity Authority. And I was interested in the um, perspective of that last speaker that the authority has a role in promoting courage and confidence in distributors uh, and contrasting that a little bit with the previous speaker who was su suggesting a prescriptive approach. I'd, I'd be interested in different distributors' perspective on that. Uh, firstly, to what extent do they favour a prescriptive approach and how prescriptive? And if they don't, uh, what, is the, what is the role of, um, the, of the authority in promoting courage and confidence? So anyone like to bite at the opportunity to answer Roger's question about what, what the nature of prescription might be? I don't know if it's worth sort of unpacking where, where the request for prescription comes from as well. There seems to be an implication there that somehow sort of homogeneous service offerings in a national market are necessary in order to meet customer uh, expectations. Uh, I don't know if that's been made explicit, but that seems to me to be what's behind this suggestion. Uh, and I don't know whether any of those who are sort of arguing for a more prescriptive approach to pricing might want to sort of explain what evidence they've had from their customers about this um, uh, or what issues they've, they've run into. Um, deafening silence. It's Craig okay. Evans from the Electricity Authority. This is a bit like a first date at the start of the first date where we're trying to get up courage to start a witty and sparkling conversation with the other party. Um, so to help things along, I'm going to ask a specific question to a specific person and go from there. It's okay, There's, it's, it's a, this is a safe place, everybody. The point of this is to have a conversation. There are, as we all say, no silly questions. This participating and asking questions will help the day and help us get to a place. So, Roger Sutton. Um, Courage and confidence. 
where does a, dis a, a distributor, the board of a distributor is making a decision that will, uh, about price structures that will result in winners and losers. You're going to hear from the losers, uh, and I, um, I've seen people from distributors here that have an experience with uh, winners and losers and could tell you all about how that goes. So you're in a perspective, Roger or someone else. Um, you're about to make a decision that will result in losers. What sort of things is being discussed or being thought about? What are the factors you're considering? What sort of weight does a distributor give to efficiency over uh, the communication challenges of uh, responding to concerns of people who are on the unfortunate side of a pricing change? I mean, most of these, m m most of these, um, most of these New Zealand distributors are very much locally owned. Directors live in the local communities, so they're very aware that when there are losers, they're going to have to face up to them in the supermarket, at dinner parties on Saturday night, and those sort of things. Which is where I come back to the, the, the courage and confidence from the EA, almost to speak on behalf of the people who aren't the losers, who are the winners, but only small winners. So that's really the role there that we want. You know, I, th I think there's a role for someone to try and. Um, present the view of hopefully the minor um, hopefully the majority who are advantaged by this. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, the directors here are there also to have courage as well, and sometimes make hard decisions that will actually disadvantage some groups of customers if they think that's actually in the long-term interest of the business. But we want a bunch of people in fancy dark Wellington suits who, at those key moments, um, are willing to be on the stand with them, um, explaining some of these realities. Does that answer it? But, uh, but I think no, I'm, I've done enough talking today. Is that, is that the way that other distributors reckon they're going to face the hard calls? Because cause I think what's behind your question, Craig, is this sort of there's a natural conservatism and inertia that may mean that you just duck the difficult question, particularly if you can see that it's going to be unpopular with some constituencies. Um, and if the alternative is you just don't reform your pricing for another 12 months, then you might be doing another job in 12 months and someone else can probably take the negative media. And, that, and that's the concern. Um, and certainly my experience with the work we've done in the Smart Grid Forum in New, is New Zealand is in this really very fortunate situation where the moderately misguided subsidy programs of governments overseas have given us a bit of an insight into just how rapidly customers may start voting with their checkbooks checkbooks, do you remember those? Um, if given options that they find attractive. And a lot of people, when we started the conversation, said, don't worry, it'll never happen here. It's only happening because of subsidies overseas. And I think now the consensus is, oh my God, the price of these things may continue to fall as rapidly as it has done for the last 15 years. And as soon as it falls to a certain point, then Bunnings will be absolutely overrun with people taking control of their own destiny. I do hope we've got enough time to get ourselves organized. And it's an interesting tension, right, between whether you're prepared to take the brave call and start reforming the pricing towards this more service-based approach, which will help customers evaluate the pros and cons of spending their own money on complementary alternatives, or whether you just choose to go home at 4 o'clock and start looking for another job before the end of the year. And I think that's at the, at the heart of what Craig's asking. Have we got somebody... Who is it? Tim. Tim, from the authority. I had a question for uh, Nathan. Uh, I guess we've seen that uh, you know, there's a lot of agreement that, it, that uh, you know, emerging technology and other issues are, uh, are uh, arriving on the scene and, and that uh, also there's an imperative to, uh, for distributors to act reasonably urgently because, of course, the, the longer you leave it, the, the, uh, the harder the problems get the greater the imperative to change. Um, I, I'm just interested uh, to, to see, I, I guess we, we've seen some distributors uh, make uh, changes to their pricing already and, and, and others who haven't. And I, I'm just interested in, in your perspective, I guess, as a, as a distributor. Uh, why, why do you think there's a, there's a divergence there? Um, wh why do you think we've seen some, some, some act and some not? And, uh, 
do you think you're li we're likely to see this divergence continue into the future? Um, and, and what sort of timing do, do you think is, is realistic for, for all distributors to, uh, to act in this space? Um, there's a lot of questions in there, and I hope I make sure I cover them all. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, Unison obviously went through a fairly bruising experience with the introduction of our... Into it. I can't hear a thing you're saying. Thanks, Alan. Okay, now? That's better. Uh, so Unison obviously had a fairly bruising experience uh, with the introduction of our distributed pricing category, and, and I guess that's probably put us all on notice that, that that initial communications with customers has to be spot on uh, in terms of explaining what we're doing and why and building that, that case for change. And, you know, we underestimated the, 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 the impact that, that our new price category would have. Um, still don't back away from, from having done it because I think it's absolutely the right thing to do in terms of a step in the right direction. Um, but, but I think as a result of that, uh, and other distributors can, can talk to this, there's probably a, an element of safety in numbers in future. Um, you know, that, that we are all engaged very heavily in the ENA's distribution pricing working group. I think pretty much every single member is represented in that and taking a very active interest. Um, so I think there'll be a lot of collaboration in terms of people sharing their, their designs, um, sharing their experiences in terms of how they're planning to communicate with customers. So I think we probably won't, I, know, I would hope we, we don't see a, a lot of divergence in terms of um, future approaches, um, but there will be some more, more coordination around that. But, but I think, you know, at the end of the day, it is in every company's, you know, decision-making framework to think, you know, how important is it to, to make a move? Um, we felt it was really important in terms of our customers making those really important uh, and, and expensive decisions to face, you know, more accurate pricing signals. Um, it's a step in the right direction. It's certainly not the end point that we had been thinking about. <clears throat> but, um, you know, the worst thing for a customer is to make a $10,000 investment and then a few years later find out, oh, actually, um, this is not going to prove out, prove to be economic. You know, one of the, we've done a lot of talking with customers um, since we introduced our price category, and including those that have made the decision to to go solar. And uh, and one of the guys you know, I talked to, he he'd, he'd borrowed fourteen thousand dollars from the bank to to put panels on his roof. It was basically his retirement plan. Um, didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of money in his KiwiSaver account, um, but thought he was doing the right thing by his family paying $50 a week um, to the bank to pay this off by the time he retires. And, you know, it's that kind of customer that we think about when, when we make our pricing decisions. Jenny, do you want to follow up on that? No, no, you've got to wait for the microphone and make sure people know who you are, and then you can talk. Just a follow-up question. Is there any learnings in hindsight that you, could have, you would have done to have improved the communication? I think just being on the front foot a lot earlier. You know, we did some limited communications around our pricing change before it, it happened. Um, we just needed to be a lot more vocal. Um, yeah, just not not afraid really. You know, it's very. I mean, I went along to a um, a Green Party organised meeting in the Clive Town Hall. Um, I was ready for pitchforks and so forth. Um, actually, it proved to be a really good experience, a really positive experience in terms of, you know, once you take the time to actually sit down with customers, explain what's going on, why you're doing it, people actually do understand. Uh, don't necessarily like what you're doing, but they do understand it. So I think getting on the front foot, not being afraid to talk to customers, is, you know, I think that's a real challenge for distributors. We don't often do that, uh, but it will be important. And Nathan, has the, the sort of insights that you've gone through, has this realisation about the sort of level of insight you need to have into the impacts that you may sort of create with change made you less likely to scamper ahead and get on with it? Or do you think it is just a, you know, a question of following through your process and you're no less courageous about taking the first move? It seems to me it's not unlike this, this conversation here that nobody really wants to start talking because they don't want to look stupid in front of everyone else. But if everyone feels like that, then we could be waiting an awfully long time. Oh, by the way, um, the doors are actually locked, so you don't get out until 
12.30, so we can all sit here in silence or we can start having a conversation, but, you know, it's entirely up to you. But that's a bit the problem, isn't it? You know, everyone sort of noticed that it's quite hard doing this properly without sort of dealing with the dragons that, that Roger's talking to us about. Um, I was just interested in sort of where, where you are in, individually with that, you know. Yeah, so, so the process that we're working through right now is to do a lot more modelling around, you know, how do we create, you know, that, that sort of long-term price structure that we can apply across the board. So at the moment we have a sort of fairly targeted approach. Can you... Let the, what we have a fairly targeted approach um, in terms of, you know, different price profiles for different customer groups, but you know, I think there's a, a huge benefit in terms of simplification that we can achieve with you know, the, the right kind of, you know, whether it's capacity-based or time-of-use uh, pricing approach. So you know, the next step for us is very much to think about um, yeah, how, how, do we, how do we do that sort of mass deployment of a new pricing approach, which carries a lot more risk with it, and certainly you've got to you know, make sure that, that all the modelling and, and that is, is done well so you don't make mistakes or, or minimise that, that opportunity. So I've got another question over here before I let Phil go. Um, it does seem to me that there is a re related question which I didn't really notice coming up in any of the discussions, which is about which of the businesses are going to be impacted adversely in which sequence. And there's an interesting sort of urban-rural question, you know, which customers will move first with their money. But there's also a business scale question that, you know, there's an enormous difference between the size of some of the lines businesses, and some may have the ability to absorb uneconomic outcomes much more than others. Um, I didn't want to put you on the spot, Ken, but you've talked about this in some context just because Scampower is so small. Um, and I was interested in how what's happening on your network has sort of changed your thinking in terms of how you're going to reform your prices and when you're going to reform them and whether there are some learnings around insights. Maybe you just explain what's been going on in your part of the world as well. It might be quite useful for everyone else. The trick with the microphones, it's like eating an ice cream. You have to shove it right in front of your face and then it works. Okay, that's working. Uh, Ken Mitchell, I'm from uh, Scan Power, which is in the Tararua district at the uh, southern end of the Hawke's Bay. Uh, we're the second smallest line company uh, in New Zealand. Uh, for the past 10 years, we've probably experienced a 30% um, a, uh, drop in the amount of volume of energy wheeled over our system. Uh, we now take less than 50% uh, of our revenue comes from our line charges, less than that. So we're diversifying quite a bit as a business. And um, the question I'd ask in regard to distribution pricing is um, the industry has, or the regu regulator has quite a narrow view of what a distribution business is. Um, uh, and the regulations are based around our role as a distributor. That's changing um, quite a bit because we have to hang on to value and make sure we survive, otherwise we can't do the distribution bit. Um, so um, my, my question would be what is going to be the role of distributors in the future? You know, we can invest in PV, uh, we can install batteries, um, we can uh, fill the role of an energy broker uh, on a network so prosumers sell energy from one to the other, we can facilitate all that. Uh, in, in, our, in our area, we're involved in the negotiation of what transmission services customers have. Um, how does that all fit in distribution pricing and where we're changing and how we're changing? And if we don't have, um, uh, if we're restricted um, to, the, to the old model, um, we, we could die a death. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hear about what other people have to do about constraints on how we're going to compete within the industry and, and, the, uh, and, and externally in the industry. On the um, topic that Roger mentioned about the EA supporting um, uh, 
the industry. I think if you're the people that set the rules for the game we're playing, um, you've got to take some responsibility for what happens. So um, definitely, um, if there's some hard questions to answer publicly, um, we, we need your support in that. Um, yeah, just just makes sense that we can't have, um, you know, give us a loaded gun, we need to be able to fire it, just try to make sure that, uh, that uh, we're not pointing it at you when we do. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ken. So anyone, uh, uh, Phil, you're, uh, you're loaded as a gun, but you're not allowed to speak yet, <laughs> because I'm just interested if anyone wants to build on, on that before we let you rip because that could be the rest of the session. So um, uh, so there's this sort of conversation about the evolving role of distributors leading to the incentives to, to manage their pricing in different ways, in different contexts. Does anyone else have any perspectives on that that might be worth adding? Is there somebody underneath at the back? Hi, John. Gillian Bly, Meridian. It wasn't so much building on Ken, but it was following on from conversations with Nathan, are just about needing to be practical. I mean, we've got 29 distributors. Having a great communication program is going to be absolutely, you know, essential. You know, we are going to have to give um, instructions to our call centre staff to be able to explain to customers why they are seeing changes in their bills and to be able to do that in a way that um, is manageable one of the things I think we will need to think about is actually a staggered approach because if everything was to happen on the 1st of April, even if it's not 2017, it's 2018, which is when we tend to see um, distribution price changes, of actually being able to, to, to handle all of that if we've got 29 totally different approaches which you've then got to work through within your pricing teams and work through with your comms teams about how you're going to explain why everything's so different. So that need for coordination is, is going to be very important. It's also going to be very important to have the regulator sitting behind and being able to engage in that conversation absolutely on the morning reports or the nine to knowns to help with that conversation. I guess my other comment I would make is that, you know, we've got about 10,000 ICPs with solar on at the moment. The longer we leave it, we might have 20,000, or we might have 30,000, or we might have even more. And so we've, I do totally agree with Roger's comments that we've got to have the courage and the confidence to, to go through and decide what we're going to do. And if the interim step lasts for a bit longer than some of us would perhaps ideally like, that's a trade-off that directors on distribution companies are going to have to make a decision on. Any more on this, this line? We could go there, but we should probably let Phil run. Phil, where have you gone? Oh, there you are. Hi. Introduce yourself. Phil Anderson from uh, Electric Kiwi. Uh, as uh, Mike Pryor said, we're one of the uh, evil new retailers who are taking parents away from their kids by uh, engaging them. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I guess I wanted to comment on, uh, which ties into all of this, which is, I, think, I guess started with Roger's comments about um, having to be prepared for the fallout for changes and making the case to the public. Um, but. I, I, I kind of think this relies on a view which is implicit on assuming that the way that retail pricing has worked continues to work, which is that the networks decide a structure and then that largely gets passed through to the end customer. But I, I guess we support a view much more in line with what Jenny said where you have this notion of the networks should provide cross-reflective pricing, but that's not necessarily what the retailers will do to incentivise a change in behaviour. Um, so I guess that's the kind of approach which, which we would encourage is to say, let's just work out the, the most cost reflective way we can do this and if that involves complexity, that's fine because the retailer will then decide, you know, how do you actually get some, how, how do you take these, the costs which you're seeing and then get your customers to respond in the right ways. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's my point I wanted to make. Any ca counter views? Simon, do you want to? 
Oh, maybe a bit of colour around that, actually. One of, the, um, one of the things that we've commissioned in the Smart Grid Forum this year was a, um, a survey of uh, admittedly very engaged customers and their attitudes towards smart appliances and smart home solutions. And we gave them a bit of a ranking list of which of a whole panoply of services they were most interested in and you know it was a bit sort of mixed at the top end but the resounding winner for the least popular outcome was to have the power company controlling appliances in their own home which we thought was quite ironic as that is by far the most widely adopted technology in New Zealand because ripple control is ubiquitous around New Zealand and we're very proud of it. So we published this, it's available on the Smart Grid Forum website at no charge um, in February, I think it was, uh, to a deafening silence. But a couple of weeks ago, one of the network companies dropped us a note and said, well, we've just had what we think may be the winter peak. And um, during the winter peak, Ripple shaved whatever it was, 300 megawatts off our system peak demand. Um, and uh, I wonder whether customers really understand how much it would have cost to build to reinforce for that peak. Um, to which somebody said, um, did they actually understand that trade-off? And we didn't get a reply to that email. But I mean, it's this, it's this interesting nuance between is the industry in the best position to dictate the behaviors that they want to see and to force customers to do something that the central optimizer considers to be efficient? Or is it about simply telling people how much it costs to do the things they want to do so that they can decide which of the two ways they want to go? Because the history of the industry is the former, right? It's about economies of scale, effectively. That's, that's the history of the electricity industry worldwide. And what's very interesting is that now we have distributed solutions that are competitive uh, with scale solutions. So I don't know if anyone's got any view about this sort of collision of philosophies. Um, and how, how the incentives play out there, because there is obviously quite a strong incentive uh, to try and force people to do things in a way that has scale economies, but it may uh, preclude customer choice in the process. Deafening silence. Simon, ask a provocative question. Oh, you're gonna build, Jerome, yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jerome Chapman, uh, Office of the Electricity and Gas Complaints Commissioner. Is, is, am I speaking too close? Um, just, a, just a few comments. Um, I think uh, just from what you're, you're saying, John, the, one of the things that has been mentioned quite a lot this morning is, is communication. And I think um, from the EGCC's perspective, what we see is that there is a, a I guess, a a dilemma between um, information and, and communicating with your customers and people actually um, receiving and um, accepting that communication. So I think for most people, and, and Michael recognised himself as one of these types of consumers who don't, who don't care about um, responding or engaging with pricing signals. Um, and I think the majority of consumers are like that. So when I go home, I want to turn the light on when I, when I get home. I don't want to stay in the dark until the pricing signal tells me that my prices are cheap and I want to eat when I'm hungry, so I'll heat my, heat my dinner um, when I'm hungry so, and, and not wait for a pricing signal. So I think for, for a lot of consumers, um, the information that you try and communicate with them about any potential changes um, that, you'll, that you might be making, they're going to ignore that if it doesn't affect them right now. So. If, you're, if you set your parameters as to what you expect a reasonable bill to be, to be between $80 and $120, if you're receiving three pages of information with every invoice, um, but your bill is between $80 and $120, you're not going to read anything further than that. So I, just, I guess just making some points about um, thinking about what sort of communication and how you make it and where, where is it appropriate to make uh, those communications? Is it when um, consumers are purchasing appliances? Is that the right place to inform consumers about the impact that that particular appliance uh, may have on, on demand pricing? I mean, does education about demand-based pricing need to go into, into schools or something like that where you have to learn about it because it's going to impact you for 
you know, 50 years for the rest of your life that, you, um, that you're an adult and a consumer of um, electricity um, in New Zealand. So I guess just um, sort of getting people to think about uh, sort of communication and education um, and the fact that people are generally quite resistant to, to change. And Jerome, I wonder whether you're sort of pointing to a sort of cap capability anxiety that might be um, a, a, a barrier it's a sort of um, a, an incentive not to change. Because um, I think what you're saying is it's a hell of a lot harder to communicate this in a way that doesn't create noise and actually results in people engaging in an appropriate fashion than it is just publishing a price change in the paper and uh, ticking the compliance box in your regulatory ledger. Is that, is, is that something that you've seen sort of being in the minds of people in the industry and uh, uh, do, you, do you think people are aware of just how differently it may be necessary to to manage this this communication with the wider customer group I, I think so and I'll um, I mean I'm talking a little bit later this afternoon so I'll cover some of that in, in my presentation but I think uh, the point that Roger made about actually this is going to be potentially good for, for most customers and that's the, the whole reason why any sort of change will be made, uh, but the small consumers that it does affect, um, they will be unhappy first before they understand what's happened um, to create the problem for them. Um, so uh, I don't know if it's possible to get that communication to them before, um, before the change happens and affects them. I mean, I, I guess it's, for most people, it, it's like receiving a, uh, a medical insurance uh, brochure um, when you land in the hospital, in, in, in a US hospital, when you get injured on holiday or something, and you receive the invoice for the medical care there, um, you know, that's too late. The invoice is too late. The information about travel insurance and medical insurance, that's too late. I think some of the communication that's going to happen in this space is going to be too late for consumers, so they'll be unhappy. And um, I guess, it, is it possible to to get that communication to consumers before they become unhappy, so. Thanks, yeah, and as you say, I mean, that's the, the third session um, uh, this afternoon. Um, but it does sort of raise some interesting questions around self-awareness and self-awareness of capability and whether that's actually starting to cause a bit of anxiety which may just slow the whole process down. The more people learn about what it's gonna take to do this well, the longer it might take. Right, we've got a question at the back, and then we've got a question down here. So who's at the back? It's Roger Proctor, a consultant to the authority again. Um, uh, it seems that everybody agrees that change is, of some form is inevitable. Um, uh, Brent, in his introductory remarks, talked about that change happening in a reasonably timely fashion, a and Jane Cameron, in her remarks, uh, suggested 1 April 2018 as being a realistic date, uh, I'd like to ask distributors, do they agree that that's a realistic date, and if not, uh, what is? Um, and in particular, I, since I got a deafening silence to my last question, uh, I'd, I'd like to ask uh, a small retailer, I'll ask Roger Sutton, a network Tasman, to respond, and a large retailer, if there's somebody from Vector here, could they respond? So, Roger, are you mic'd up? I mean, I'll be the uh, small distributor. Um, I mean, we're, we'd be keen to do it um, as soon as we've got our ducks in a row, so to speak. So we're, uh, we're, hurry is the wrong word, but we would think sooner rather than later is good. Um, and I guess my perspective as a, um, as a director would be, as we do it, we just want to make sure we've got our uh, communication lines really tied up with our customers and our customers perceive, say as we do it, the customers perceive we're doing it for the, the wider good and that we are going to achieve better outcomes. And that might mean we decide that we're going to do some energy efficiency stuff at the same time or something like that to show that we are genuine in trying to help our customers you know, make these changes. And Mark, there was a question at you. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to. But uh... um, Look, I think it is. It Can you just explain time. to people who you are? Oh, sorry, Mark Cohen at Victor. Um, this is a Richard might want to chime in as well, but uh, I think the key thing about timeframes is... Wait. Pardon me? Put it up there and speak into it. Apologies. Is that better? 
I think timing is important. I think customer engagement takes time, to, particularly to do it well. Um, so you could set a very ambitious time frame and live to regret it if you're rushing things and not taking your customer base with you and talking through those large things. I think we're hearing different conflicting stories today about actually engaging with customers, providing for the five different customers um, that Michael mentioned versus prescriptive and sort of being able to mandate it today so easy to roll out versus actually talking through the process. You know, this is an industry where people spend three minutes a year thinking about. So, you know, to then engage a, an effective communication strategy to understand both today's pricing, as someone talked about, but also tomorrow's pricing, that's more, gonna take more than three minutes. So um, I think that's a highly relevant factor. You know, I'm unsure about exact timing, but when you've got a large customer base and a large community to take with you, that's gotta be built into the time frame. Although Regulator Jenny was saying this must be done by whatever it was, middle of 2017, with effect sort of middle of 2018 or something, and see me in my office afterwards if it isn't. Um, and, and I guess she was interested in, well, is that what's going to happen if, if, if there was a backstop regulation around that? I think that's sneaking in behind Roger's question. Uh, what are the adverse consequences? of being encouraged to do the, the right thing. Right, I had a question at the front first, actually, before. Oh, do you want to come back on that, Roger? Yes, yeah, I do. Okay. I just want to ask my question and whether I could get a direct answer to what is a realistic date. I, I agree process is absolutely important, uh, so it can't be a guaranteed date, but what would be realistic? Do, did you want to answer that, Ken? Or Ken Mitchell from ScanPower again. Um, ScanPower has been um, billing retailers on a uh, GXP basis. That means we're using the meters at the GXP. Um, that means that our tariff has been time of use for um, you know well over 10 years now. Uh, so um, it's very easy for us to implement. Um, any change about that. It's very easy for us to send price signals through to the retailer for them to repackage whoever they like for the, uh, for the customers. So it's not, um, there's no time restriction on how quickly we can change that. The meters are already there. Um, I, I can't see any, any hassle in uh, changing pricing and sending the signals that we wish to send. Um, the, the trick is uh, how, the, uh, how the retailer will convert that into a retail tariff that's meaningful um, to the consumer. And at the moment, we don't have an involvement in that process. It's, it's not our issue to solve. And that's the, that, that's the next session. But, but if, um, uh, I don't know if we've got any other, so we, perspective, GS, GXP pricing change is very easy to, well, they are capacity-based anyway, um, but um, I, I think your question, Roger, is more if you want to transition to ICP-based pricing, which is on a demand basis, whether it's realistic to try and enforce everyone to do that by the middle of 2018, I think, is the regulatory threat. Um, and I think what you're wanting is an answer from Alliance Business or two about whether, whether that is achievable and what you might want to be worried about if it isn't. Hi, I'm Emma Lanigan, also from Network Tasman, but um, chairing the um, ENA's um, subgroup on future pricing. So just a, a few comments, I guess, on timing. Um, there are a number of smaller distributors that don't yet have um, particularly high um, penetration of smart meters, and uh, there are a range of pricing options that rely on smart meters. I think there may also be a bit of a correlation between areas that do have strong incentives to change their pricing, where there are particularly high, um, there is particularly high uptake of new technologies, but um, by consumers, but there isn't the smart metering technology to do s implement some of the price changes. Um, and just in terms of the work that we're doing um, in the subgroup, I think it's quite relevant to some of the questions that have come up around um, pricing alignment. So what we have done within that group, and we are anticipating that we'll publish um, our report for consultation in the next few weeks. And so um, 
part of that is to look at the different pricing options um, and to also facilitate some alignment by looking at even um, possible templates that uh, distributors can use. Also, that just that process of working together across distributors and um, sharing the ideas, you know, talking about um, how we might align uh, within the process. We've also had conference areas, which means that um, there's been kind of regional groupings within which there's been um, coordination as well and discussion about how we can align our pricing. Anyone want to talk about dates before we move off that? Dates reasonable, dates not reasonable? Uh, Bruce Rogers from Orion. Um, I haven't spoken so far, John, because I thought the rules of engagement were personal. Um, you didn't really want me to speak today. T took them on board that way. A um, couple of observations around timing. I think um, from the authority's perspective, it would perhaps be useful for them to reflect on their own TPM process, which is coming up to year four with a possible implementation of April 2019, which I think transparency wasn't possible. So the examples of how difficult this is to do do exist in the industry. I don't think it can go much further. Um, the other thing is, in terms of your slight on load management, John, which I guess was a bit of a joke, but I took it a wee bit seriously early on, is that um, I don't know that there's any network in New Zealand where people are required to do things because the distributor sends a price signal um, or a ripple signal out. Nearly every network I'm aware of, and certainly it's true in the Orion area, people have choices and they make choices and customers have made choices over many years, including investments that they themselves have made in technology in their house. A hot water cylinder sounds a bit low tech, 10 kilowatt hours of storage at least per day. It's actually a pretty cool battery. Um, and the distributor coordinates the use of that, but people have choices. Some people don't have their hot water cylinders controlled, some people do, some people have it only done at night. There are choices in there. there isn't, it isn't a Stalinist model. Maybe it looks like that from the outside, but actually people have choices and they've made them, and that's actually really valuable. And one of the key concerns that we had Orion have is that these changes, we need to protect to some extent what we've already got, because it's actually pretty cool. I don't know if that was our email that you were referring to earlier, but we do think it's actually quite useful to be able to deliver the same amount of energy across the network on the coldest day in winter without affecting people's service levels, but at something like 100 megawatts lower than it would otherwise have been. We actually think that's pretty useful. And you might lose that, and maybe people, we should just build 100 megawatts more network. But I think we have to be very careful about just going out and building it without having a decent conversation. OK, thank you, Stalin. Were there other comments on timing, just slightly? further to the front. Thank you. Um, my name's Dale Yates, and I'm an economist at Houston Kemp, which is a micro microeconomic consulting firm um, in Australia. Um, and we've gone through a very similar process in Australia to that which you are all embarking on. Um, and there have recently been a lot of questions around timing and what is an appropriate transition to cost-reflective tariffs, um, more efficient tariffs. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that efficiency is a moving target as well. Um, and the, so too are our cost reflective tariffs. Um, and a key limitation on the benefits um, of realising the benefits of cost reflective tariffs are um, our customers actually learning around the costs, um, how their um, behaviour imposes costs on the network and how to respond to price signals. So I think when you talk about when should, when's an appropriate um, date, I think it's probably more appropriate to think around um, what is an appropriate starting point and how much do we? Um, how much do customers lead to learn, and how long will it take to teach it, to um, educate those customers to realise the benefits of that starting point? Um, because it's obviously going to be a learning process over a number of years to actually realise the benefits of cost-reflective pricing. Um. Thank you. Helpful. Um, looking overseas. Anything else on timing? Otherwise, I'll give you your microphone. Right. If we can just come. Uh, Jeremy Adamson from Electricity Ashburton. Um, I actually wanted to come back to the very first question which Roger asked around prescriptive versus non-prescriptive. Um, from our point of view, uh, and it's no disrespect at all to the, the EA, but they are not consumer focused. They are focused on regulating us for the benefit of the consumer, but actually speaking to the consumer and talking to the consumer is what occurs at the retail level and as well at the EDB level. So my concern around a prescriptive approach would be that it doesn't focus purely on the customer 
through direct survey, direct feedback and that sort of thing. I, I think it's hugely powerful to set the direction and tell us what you want us to achieve and then let us achieve it, which is why I'm hugely in favour of industry-led. Um, to your point um, around behavioural change, and, and I think it touches on, on Jenny's presentation as well a little, um, I'm a little bit confused as to why EDBs wouldn't have any benefit from changing consumer behaviour. Um, we have an implicit requirement to protect our network. Um, we can send pricing signals to the consumer Ideally, it's a direct link, and we, we know that doesn't happen now, but, but we do have a benefit from sending a signal to a consumer to shift their load, to protect our network. And, and the point that was raised by, by others earlier around EV, if all the EVs get brought home in the future and get plugged in at 6 p.m., that puts huge uh, in, implications on our networks. If through pricing we can shift that uh, connection from 6 p.m. to a, a different time of day through some mechanism, then as an, a network company, we have a huge benefit from shifting that behaviour. Uh, so I, I don't agree that it's just a, cons a retail uh, uh, responsibility to change consumer behaviour. EDBs do certainly have a requirement to shift behaviour. And we, we, we can do it now through load control. Um, so you know, when we start reaching our peak capacity, we can start switching off hot water cylinders. Um, that ripple control signal is, is hugely important and we need to do whatever we can to maintain that. Um, as, a, as a tool for EDVs. Um, but by itself, it's not enough. Uh, we need the, the, the load control uh, functionality, but we also need to have the signal from the EDB going to the end user customer in order to shape behaviour. Um, so it's certainly not just a, a retail thing. Um, and then in, in terms of just uh, more broadly, to the question of are EDVs incentivised, um, I'd like to suggest that We've already demonstrated demonstrably with the, the working groups that have been established that we are already embarking on this, this, this change process. So to me, the question is moot because we're already on this path. And, and it's probably my closing statement really that I, I don't get why we're talking about are we incentivised when we're already doing it. So I'll finish with that. It, uh before you sit down, it be, might be quite useful just to unpack exactly the nature of the... Because you say the benefits of having Ripple and maintaining Ripple and ensuring it's still in service and, and whatnot are, you know, obvious to you. Maybe you could just be explicit about what they are. I guess by way of example, <clears throat> so EA Networks, electricity is um, is uh, hugely focused on irrigation. That's our largest load group. Um, our network is designed to meet the capacity of the rural sector. Uh, our, our summer peak is close to 200 megawatts. Um, our winter peak is around 40 or 50. So our network's been designed for the irrigation. Um, we don't load control irrigation. Uh, we don't have the functionality or the ability to do that. Um, if, and it's still growing, the load, the load on irrigation. Um, if that continues to grow, um, we will obviously, under the standard model, keep building asset. Um, however, uh, if we could load control the irrigation um, group by way of choice, like providing two tariffs rather than one, one being load control, one being non, um, we have the ability then to, to um, either avoid entirely the, the investment that might be required to provide additional capacity um, or defer it. Uh, and my concern with where we are now with the disruptive technology that's approaching is, is that we could end up investing in, in 40, 50 year assets that in five or 10 years time might be completely surplus because the, the, the consumer uh, has already gone and done their own thing uh, for whatever reason. We know they're irrational um, and, and so we can't control that. The whole disruption will be consumer led. Um, and, and so we would like to do what we can using the tools we have today to, to avoid future investment uh, in growing capacity, uh, given the issue that in five or 10 years time that capacity may not be required. Um, and so that's why load control is hugely important to us. Um, we know uh, that it is entirely feasible to load control irrigation. A farmer will tell you that um, it's, it's, no, when I want water it's gonna go 24 seven for as long as I want it. The reality is that with smart sensors and other technologies um, applied to that equation, we can actually avoid irrigation for 24 hours or even 48 hours. Um, it's not necessary, but it's just that it's not 
part of their uh, way of operating right now. So, so that, that's the low control question. Um, but then equally we can deal with pricing. Um, it's just the problem with the pricing is that the signal does get lost um, in, 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 in the retail bill. And that, that's not a problem of the retailer per se, it's the nature of the industry. We wrap transmission, generation, distribution and retail costs into one single bill. It's hugely problematic for a customer to understand that. Um, and and we'll, we'll get to that in, in the session after lunch, but, but I, I just want to sort of stay where we are with this at the moment. So you're saying there's a benefit to investment deferral, and there's also this sort of future option for not investing in something that may not have a use at some point in the future. And I'm interested in whether that's because you're consumer owned or whether it's because there's something else going on that makes you worried about getting your money out. Effectively, you're sort of saying these are, these are risky investments and they're becoming increasingly risky. It doesn't have to be you answering. Um, we can talk to other people. But if you, if you have a view, um, up, it's entirely up to you. <laughs> I'm just trying to think how to answer that, really. Um, I don't think it's that we are consumer-owned. It's that we are consumer-focused. Uh, and I think that's a difference. Um, perhaps we are consumer focused because we are consumer owned and we can argue that, but um, yeah, I mean, we have a strong vested interest to do the best for our local constituents that, that own us. I mean, we're the only cooperative in the country, but we don't operate differently to a trust uh, necessarily. Um, but, but we don't want our, our local economy to be saddled with additional costs that could have been deferred. If you look at the big picture, our local economy is hugely dependent on, on costs that we can't avoid, rates and, and other such things. So if we, if we wrap our costs into that, then of course we have an incentive to keep those suppressed, if possible, for the greater benefit of our local economy. Uh, we, we, we view um, our business far beyond our own P&L and balance sheet. We, we view our business um, as a um, mainstay of, of the infrastructural assets that are required for our local economy um, and, and we exist to support that. Um, if, if we took a, a purely commercial view, we'd try and throw more assets in the ground and get a regulated return on them because it'll make more money for our shareholders, whoever they may be. Um, so, and, and, and that's the next move in the conversation. So thanks for the answer, but not, not all lines businesses are cooperative or trust owned. And it rather begs the question of, well, if you have the incentives, do those incentives apply to all lines businesses? Because we're hearing something about all New Zealand in this conversation. So I'm interested in whether there's an ownership incentive thing which we need to surface here. Simon, do you want to say something brilliant? And um, say who you are I, I, first. Simon Coates from Concept Consulting. I was really going to ask the question which you've already just asked. Um, one of the things I found interesting from looking at the submissions to the authorities' uh, consultation was that there, a number of uh, submitters said that their community-owned uh, network companies probably were incentivized to implement price structures that promoted in the long term uh, a smaller asset base. Um, but uh, they said that they didn't think that the case had been made that investor-owned did have this uh, same incentive, and that, uh, as the uh, fellow from EA Networks had said, that the, uh, their strict commercial incentive may be to, as, as they put it, throw assets on the ground and uh, earn a nice regulated return on those assets. Um, and I was uh, interested in, uh, say, the views of some of the speakers, later, Roger or Nathan, as to whether they believe there may be this difference between community and investor-owned, and to the extent there is, do they think the current or the, the new proposed Part 4 regime provides a strong positive incentive to promote prices, which in the long term may lead to a smaller asset base? Yeah, that's a good question. So I don't know if there's anyone from an investor owned, well, even Ken, you're community owned, but. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, um, scam pair again, small, 100% uh, consumer trust. Um, our business is actually owned by our customers, so if we lose value by the way we run and operate that, it's our customer that loses. Um, again, um, 
Not, not everyone has uh, high growth on their network, so we certainly don't have 200 megawatts of irrigation. We are a dairying area, but um, if I was to invest in um, uh, power lines capacity uh, to meet growing dairy demand, uh, in some ways we contribute towards that um, the, the bullish growth of that industry, which is not looking so flash now. Um, and um, uh, we, we, we weaken the economy by inefficient investment. So, so um, New, New Zealand-wise, um, I really do think uh, this industry um, in total has got its entire cost structure sort of overcooked. Uh, when I look at um, when I look at things like um, uh, the retail electricity tariff on our network's about 33 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and um, look at uh, Australia talking about time of use tariffs with peak times at 50 cents per kilowatt hour. And uh, I know that a diesel generator is going to cost me 22 cents a kilowatt hour to run. Uh, we're, we're not dealing with things in a, you know, we've got the pricing structure wrong in, in how we've valued generation and energy. Um, and uh, it's, it's not about um, um, necessarily the distribution component, but we're, we're all part of it. Transmission, I mentioned our, our electricity's consumption has gone down 30% 30, 30 in 10 years. Well, our transmission cost in that same period has gone up twice. So, um, uh, and that's a third of our costs. So, what are we signalling here? Uh, and it comes back to that question about um, investment in in core grid uh, supply versus distributed energy systems. I think the um, the risk with the core grid is that we um, we define what level of reliability, what level of service um, that the customer will pay for. And uh, uh, the new technologies are giving them choices over yeah. not that. And very shortly, we're going to get um, uh, pressure from consumers about, well, I don't care if my power stays off all night. I only use a kilowatt hour anyway. Um, so I don't want to pay transmission charges. Um, if the power goes off, leave it off. I'll use my battery or start my generator up or whatever. Um, and I think our, our energy costs are quite, um, uh, the, the customer's been used to hedge our generation costs basically through, through the level of uh, retail tariff and um, I, I think that's, uh, that's a weakness and it needs to come down sooner or later. So, so but th this is very helpful, Ken. So, so even if the investor-owned companies are a bit shy about talking, we can talk about Australia. So that's it's a good place to talk about when you want to make fun of people. How's the um, women's hockey going? Is that, is that going quite well for you? It's good. Um, so distribution investment's been pretty aggressive in Australia over the last 10 years. And as a proportion of the delivered um, uh, retail price, distribution charges in Australia have increased an awful lot in the last 10 years, all with regulatory blessing, all with needs cases. But I think the point Ken's making is that what that means in Australia is that reticulated electricity is considerably less attractive compared to these distributed alternatives than it is in an underbuilt or marginally overbuilt environment, which is this sort of tension we have with the trust-owned and community-owned businesses over here. And it really is starting to surface this question around stranding, right, which nobody really seems to want to talk about in the room at the moment. So I'm just wondering whether we need to just take off the clothes and have a bit of a conversation about this, because I think there are some implicit assumptions, and it sits behind the price revenue cap discussion that we haven't had yet as well, but which is in several of the submissions. Um, but I think what you're saying, Ken, is 
The incentive is, uh, if you can see technology change and increasingly low-cost competitive alternatives turning up on the horizon, the incentive is to make the cost of the legacy service as low as possible so you stave off the um, competitive alternative. Um, and then the counter-cry to that that I've read in the submissions is, yeah, but if you're commercially incentivized and you don't care about your communities, then the incentive is simply to build the assets and get your regulated return. And the compact is financial capital maintenance. That's the, that's the bit we haven't talked about, so about right. Um, you put your money in, you get your regulated rate of return, and you get money, your money out. And if assets get stranded, it's okay, because the asset stranding is socialized across everyone else in, in the business, which we also haven't talked about. So, Callum, I don't want to put you on the spot, um, but those of you who have been watching this one, so in parallel with this process, the Commerce Commission is doing its statutory review of the input methodologies and rather imaginatively they've actually identified emerging technologies as an area which may require them to review the regulatory settings in the input methodologies and they've talked explicitly about stranding but it's in a very nuanced way and they um, in the topic paper on emerging technologies they draw a distinction between asset stranding and network stranding okay um, I will attempt to explain the difference, but I might give you the opportunity to do a better job of it. And the, the text in, the, and it's just a draft decision, people, so don't panic yet, but the text in the paper talks about the political unsustainability of an environment in which entire networks get stranded. And the implication there is that even if you have a regulatory compact which guarantees financial capital maintenance, if you wind up in the situation Ken is talking about, then it would be politically untenable to allow stranded assets on a very large scale to be recovered from consumers. And, you know, the rules would be changed. And so the, this, this draft position from the Commission is saying there is just as strong an incentive on those companies who are subject to the regime as those excluded companies whose ownership sort of sorts this one out. So, Callum, do you want to maybe make a few comments on that? And, Correct me if I've mis-expressed what's in that. Yeah, thanks, John. And explain who you are as well. <laughs> uh, Callum Gunn from the Commerce Commission. So, uh, in fact, it was about a year ago we were in this room, in fact, where we were kicking off the input methodologies review process, and, and there was deathly silence in response to some of the questions as well during that um, session. And one of the big topics we had that we opened up that forum is well, what's the implications of emerging technology in the distribution sector, and what does that mean for the rules that we set in the Commerce Commission, which have the rather esoteric name of input methodologies? And some of you will be aware we first set those rules that underpin price quality regulation and information disclosure regulation back in 2010, and we have a statutory obligation to review those within every seven years. And we kicked that process off last year, and we're intending to get the final decisions on that review completed at the end of this year. So we just released our draft decisions on that in uh, June. Uh, submissions closed a couple of weeks ago, and in fact, cross submissions are coming in tomorrow. Now, of two key topics that are relevant of today's session is one of our topic themes on emerging technology, and the other one, which we may come to later, is the question on former control price cap versus revenue cap. And one of the key themes that came across in the emerging technology space was on the boundary of regulated services and the nature of competition and so on, which one of the uh, questioners alluded to this morning. But another one was this question which Nathan raised in his presentation this morning about the nature of the regulatory compact. And it's the implicit view that to the extent that businesses are re relatively uh, given the opportunity to earn a normal return on the assets that are recognised to provide the regulated service, the trade-off for that is that they have a relatively low rate of return allowed as a result of that. If, and at the moment, the way our rules work is that if assets are effectively physically stranded, let's say there's a line that's no longer used, that does remain in the regulated asset base and businesses are allowed to make a return and recover that. The question is, and the consumer view that we've had submissions on, is perhaps that's inappropriate. In competitive markets, assets do get stranded, businesses do make a loss. But I think if you look overseas, the way that kind of agreement works is that the assets that go in, you get a return on that over time. The trade-off would be if there is some stranding economically or financial of those assets, the trade-off is then is that the cost of capital being allowed to those businesses would effectively have to go up. So that's the nature of the trade-off. 
It's interesting to know a number of us, I think, in the room were at the uh, ACCC conference a couple of um, uh, weeks ago, and one of the topic sessions was on this notion of the regulatory compact and what it meant. And it was interesting that some of the positions being pointed there is that the regulatory compact's not really between the regulator and regulated parties, but it's actually between government and regulated parties, and the regulator has a role to play in that. And I think that's one of the things we were getting at in our draft decision, is that ultimately we would never be in a position of being able to provide a guaranteed return on these assets because ultimately there's market risk and political risk that potentially the regulator, it, when push comes to shove and demand changes dramatically, just doesn't have an influence over. And so if there really is significant shocks to the industry and significant demand shocks, at that stage, that raises political risk questions. So that's a, a little bit of perspectives. We're in our draft um, considerations at the moment. Uh, there's a bit of time to get cross submissions in until tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, the next step in our process, we'll be putting out a process paper in September uh, indicating the extent to which we intend to be able to continue with our time frames given the submissions that have come in. And we're looking at putting out a revised draft in October. We're still aiming for a final in December. Yeah, so that's another, it's another level of nuance on the, the self-interest that Nathan was talking about, where you know, you're looking at sinking a hell of a lot of money into these businesses in the next few years, and you want to be pretty sure you're going to get your money out and you're going to make your return. So you know, even, uh, e even in a regime that looks like it's a one-way bet, which is the allegation in some of the, uh, um, some of the submissions, maybe, maybe it's not an entirely one-way bet because of the political constraints. And I guess the question there is, is that enough of an incentive to ensure a timely evolution? Um, and then you've got other submitters saying, well, no, the merit of this price cap regulation is that, you know, if something happens very abruptly during a regulatory period, then the regulated businesses lose value really quite quickly, and that should keep them honest. So I don't know if anyone's got any observations about that before we, uh, before we move on. Greg, introduce yourself and then do your bit. Yeah, thanks, John. Uh, Greg Skelton, Wellington Electricity. I was going to wait to speak till after lunch, but um, John goaded me into <laughs> being an investor company that should uh, say a few words. And a lot of this communication is about the uncertainty or the unknown, so we'll fill in the gaps ourselves. And I want to dispel a couple of those. Investor-based companies also rationalise their networks, they rationalise their investments of their assets, and that is about what John's touched on is, is asset stranding. So we are there primarily to do the same as what a consumer-based company would be doing. And there's several examples of that, our sister companies in Australia and our involved in putting in commercial solar installations because from the point of view of how price regulation is traveling through there, there are parts of the consumer market that they can make a return on that investment as a service to the customer that is valued than the traditional network asset build. Similarly in Wellington, you've seen uh, in the media if you've been following it, there are assets due for replacement uh, on our existing trolley bus network those assets are likely not to be replaced due to the fact they're at the end of their life. And to recreate a 50, 70 year old tram system for another 50 years doesn't make a lot of sense when we're really on the tipping point of battery driven, battery electric buses becoming fully commercialised. So we're better to put the investment into that system than try and recreate what happened 50 years ago. And we're all at the same point in our electricity networks is that if we invest in these assets, they do have 50 year lives and therefore we've got to be very careful about what we're going to renew. And sometimes rationalising what we do is maybe the best idea. And that may be by taking some new technology as a way of helping us through, provide the services to customers or keep listening to customers as to what services they require from us. Thanks very much, Greg. So anyone want to go anywhere else with this sort of question of sort of self-interest and financial uh, sort of financial pers perspectives yeah <clears throat> Todd Douglas from energy strategies I'm a newcomer to the industry and sort of from the outside looking in there's an element through the TPM and this review of uh, centralized system uh, looking after its own patch I think new technology is coming and the big incentive for the entire industry is actually to keep customers engaged and hooked up to the system and contributing. Communications will be really important in selling your message as to why these changes uh, are important. 
And um, customers just want the lights to come on when they flick the switch at home. At the uh, World Grid Edge Forum up in San Jose in June, an interesting statistic came out that on average consumers spend eight minutes a year considering their electricity options. It's going to be a difficult sell for the industry uh, to convince consumers of the change and why it's necessary. And has anyone got any views? We've t heard a little bit about designing your own tomorrow or whatever, whatever the, uh, the, the, the pitch was, but this idea that for sure that's, that's true at the moment. The question is, is there a future in which some customers are considerably more engaged? I mean, Phil's just stuck his hand up and pleaded guilty to engaging customers only for an hour a day, though. I mean, the rest of the time they don't care, but just that one hour, they care. Um, and Steve had me pretty excited over breakfast. Actually, I got a text telling me that I needed to switch everything off or pay the money, and, uh, you know, so uh, that, uh, that's, you know, that's, that's starting to change. So I'm interested in this, this ev evolving question of the incentives, um, how, you know, at the moment, um, customers have a certain in interest, but is customer pressure enough to drive this, this change, or is there a need for a bit of a nudge here, um, are commercial incentives strong enough to ensure the companies do it, or do they need a little bit of a nudge to make sure this happens in a timely fashion so that we don't wind up in a situation arguably like they have in Australia, in some states? Um, any, any more contributions on that theme? I mean, you're not going to get out for another 12 minutes, so we can just sit here and look at our feet. Um, are there any other topics? Oh, we've got two hands over here. We'll do behind Molly, and then we'll do Molly. Oh, apparently, uh, it's just you beat her to it, so I thought sort of it's only fair. Sorry, we we'll may pass back to Molly, actually. That was a process question for you, John, about when and how you intend to deal with the questions that were emailed before the um, conference. Oh, that's a really good point, actually. Did somebody print them out? They did, didn't they? Were you the emailed questions? Why, why, why don't you ask your email questions? Sorry, that's an administrative cock up on my part, probably. Knock yourself out. But can you just introduce who you are and ask your question? Um, uh, Neil Warbrand, consultant. Um, two emailed questions, actually, for the EA. Um, first of all, does the EA have a view on the nature of a possible market failure which might require regulatory intervention? And a second related question is, does the EA have a view on what market evidence might trigger the need for regulatory intervention? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Sorry, we did get those, and I was even given them, but I don't have them printed out. Um, Craig, do you want to make the stab at answering them? Thank you. Craig Evans, Electricity Authority. Um, sorry, Neil, yours were the only two questions that we got in. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think it was a... The opportunity was open to everybody, though. Um, those two questions, when we looked at them, um, the answer was that's the answers to those questions are the reason we're here today. Is that at this point, sort of, our expectations and how it goes are, are things that we're looking at. So, um, the views of the people in this room and otherwise are, are the ones we're interested in to the answer to those questions. And if anybody wants to uh, uh, give their view as to the market failure or the, what was it, the, second, the market failure that, that it's exists. What, it's what the triggers to intervention might be. And the triggers to intervention, or should be, uh, we'd be happy to hear those. I, um, and if it helps to prompt a, a response, I'm, I think I remember correctly, um, one of the submissions to our consultation paper from contact suggested that uh, distributors uh, didn't have sufficient incentives to uh, introduce more efficient pricing. Um, would Catherine care to elaborate on, um, on, those, on those? Catherine Thompson from Contact Energy. We made that um, comment in the context of the um, comments also made by Michael Pryor earlier. Um, around um, the incentives to um, roll this stuff out. I mean, I think over the last hour and a half, we've heard there's different risk profiles, there's different timing um, horizons, and 
um, different ideas about what should roll out um, in relation to distribution pricing. And as a result, we um, felt it was important to highlight that there needed to be some form of incentive. We used, you know, prescription as an incentive, um, regulation, however you want to call it, but um, the need to the need to require the the distributors, the 29 distributors we have to deal with, um, to do something in a fashion that will allow customers to ultimately win or not lose, because if the examples that we've seen of regulatory intervention, for example, in relation to um, use of system agreements and how that rolled out, it was not efficient. Customers have um, possibly lost as a result of it, and we wanted to see this opportunity for change to um, learn from those mistakes and, um, and, and get some form of um, sort of consistency across what customers are going to experience. Well, thanks, Catherine. So, so I think there's, I mean, we're starting to see a bit of a division of view here that is almost a disagreement. So you've got Gillian and Catherine on the one hand saying you've got 29 lines businesses, you're trying to run a national service, and the risk is that if one company moves ahead of another one, then consumers in certain part of the country lose out, and it's all terribly difficult. And on the other hand, you've got Brent's introduction where he's saying, well, we could regulate, um, but all the companies are completely different. Their assets are in completely different states and conditions. Their characteristics of demand change are completely different. And it's amazingly different, difficult for us in the middle to make these claims. So we're giving you guys the opportunity to sort it out. And so I think what's, what's sort of behind this is, well, what's the evidence that there's national benefit in having a sort of everyone jump? It's like, like, you know, changing which side of the road you drive on. There's a clear national benefit to coordinating that. Um, <laughs> but the question is, do you need to coordinate the timing of the evolution of distribution prices around the country? And what's the disbenefit of not doing that, Mark? Yeah, I, just, I was quite interested in the comment um, from Can you the energy consultant, the uh, Mark Toner from Victor. And I was just wondering, I, I think there'd be good value in the room, as particularly people from outside the industry, because you know, this is not the only industry to think about pricing reform. I'm particularly interested to understand the EA's position on the sort of telco model, which has been put up, um, I think, by Nathan, or uh, just as sort of a guidance. But I was also thinking, when you think about airports, so if, if, if this was the airline industry, Today's meeting would be equivalent of, you know, 18 airports, big and small, meeting together with Qantas and Air New Zealand and uh, Jetstar and Emirates, and all trying to agree uh, how we should structure airport pricing. I just wonder if there is some equivalent, uh, does this happen in other industries, and how are we looking at this? But I'm also interested just to understand that telco model and um, the gigabyte analogy. Anyone got any other views on this sort of... Delightfully for you, Molly, you get the final word on this session, so. Well, thank you. Molly Mellish, Domestic Energy Users Network, Dune, which is not so active now because we haven't seen many responses to submissions we've made in the past. Um, I wanted to return to investment, and in particular, uh, network investment versus consumer investment which is something that we always promoted to Electricity Authority staff. Sorry, Carl Hansen isn't here, because we have talked to him about the desire of consumers to put in their investment to uh, reduce their power bills and meet other objectives as well. In particular, some consumers really want to help the low carbon economies. And others really want their own system, which is resilient to all sorts of things that would cost an awful lot for, cons for distribution companies to protect against. That's particularly rural and remote rural customers. So many of our people want to invest. And when we see pricing responses, that basically uh, give more and more discounts for unit charges 
and now the threat of increased daily charges. I'm sorry I'm not focusing on fixed charges because demand and capacity charges can be variable. Uh, I'm focusing on daily charges, which consumers simply cannot avoid. Uh, we, many consumers can reduce not kilowatt hour demand, but reduce peak demands by everything from home insulation, LED light bulbs, right through to wood burning, which can not only reduce peaks, but also whole winter. Uh, and Molly, are you saying that the faster the industry gets on and changes this, the better, because it'll provide much clearer incentives to the people who want to explore these options to make... I'm them. saying that many, many consumers who would like to invest simply can't afford it. So we see lines companies who have all of our dollars behind them able to invest when they think that it's prudent. And some of our domestic consumers would much rather have that in investment go into their households but the warm-up New Zealand uh, has been discontinued, and other things which help making their investments affordable have been discontinued, and yet they want to see energy efficiency in their households take over from investment in new lines company assets. So I see the electricity authority focus on efficient pricing, which they think, uh, I translate their documents as promoting increased daily charges and reducing per kilowatt hour charges as something which is not necessarily consumer friendly.